My name is Will Bacher. I am your Education USA advisor here in Luxembourg. Um, I am an American citizen, um, as well as a former instructor in a uh, American university, but I live here in Luxembourg. My job is to help students and families understand how higher education in the USA works. More importantly, how you can find the best fit for your future. And that fit may well be at an American university. It could be at a community college. It could be going for a master's or a doctoral degree in the United States. Um, we can make an appointment to talk or we can exchange emails. Um, we can meet by video conference and by phone. And recently I've begun meeting under strictly uh, safe conditions uh, outdoors and in person, which has been a real pleasure. But hearing from me isn't a special opportunity. You can do that just about any week, uh, in fact, just about any day by asking for an appointment. And I'd invite you to do that by contacting me at luxembourg at educationusa.org. You're also welcome to contact the public affairs section of the US Embassy Luxembourg, which is the home of Education USA um, here. But I'd like to spend just a few moments to help you get the most out of this chance, which is a unique opportunity to talk to Kelly, who is a great source of information about the kinds of plans and decisions you'll make if you're looking at an undergraduate education in the United States. So the first thing I want to tell you about is Education USA. This is a network of advisors and resources. Um, it's provided by the US government uh, as a neutral and reliable source of information. You can Google things, of course, but there are a whole lot of people out there who provide a whole lot of different and sometimes conflicting information. The US government knows that our higher education system in the United States isn't like many others and certainly very different from most of the European university uh, systems. And so as part of our outreach uh, through the Department of State, through our foreign affairs ministry, if you want me to translate that, uh, we have the Education USA program, which consists both of an online presence that you can consult yourself, but also a network of center, centers and advisors, including the center right here in Luxembourg. So the best place to get started to find information about studying in the USA is educationusa.state.gov which you can tell by the state.gov is an official US government resource. So I'd encourage you to go there. You can also see that um, USA, Education USA and Education USA Luxembourg, in fact, have a social media presence on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. So please seek us out in those places too for the most recent information and uh, also exciting things like scholarship alerts that are specific to students from places like Luxembourg who uh, would use it to finance their education in the USA. Now, uh, a little bit of this introduction might be a repeat for those of you who attended the April 12th webinar. Um, I, and I wanna give you maximum time for questions and answer with Kelly because this is an unusual opportunity for you. So what I'm gonna do is recommend if you want the full overview uh, that you look at the webinar recording on the 12th of April. So we had a similar webinar to this, also talking with students from the US who happened to be in Luxembourg, but I took a little bit more time for an introduction on that one, and I don't wanna waste anybody's time here. So you can find information like the definitions and distinctions you see on the screen right now by going to YouTube and taking a look at that. Now you can take a picture of that with your phone and use that QR code. I just also put the link in the chat. You can also just find us by using your favorite search engine and asking for YouTube Education USA Luxembourg. And that'll take you to a list of videos that includes actually a few other webinars, but I'm directing you to the one that's uh, 12 April, 2021. I do wanna introduce a few terms. Uh, one is I've already used is undergraduate. Uh, and this is basically the next level after a Luxembourgish Lycée. It's where you get your bachelor's degree. And for most specializations, a bachelor's degree earned in the United States and a bachelor's degree earned in France or Germany or the UK, these are all equivalent. The US typically takes four years rather than three, which is more normal in a European university. And Kelly's actually going to help explain some of the reasons why that's the case, particularly when she talks about liberal arts programs. Uh, and there are a few exceptions like law and medicine where professional qualifications aren't exactly equivalent, where it may be more or less difficult for you to finish with your what we call terminal degree or the degree that allows you to practice professionally law or medicine. Uh, it also gets a little complicated in uh, areas 
areas like architecture or even dance. So uh, obviously these are areas where I'm going to recommend that you contact your Education USA advisor, that's me, and we have an individual conversation because chances are I've helped another student with those uh, same issues. And if not, it's very easy for me to either talk to my colleagues or to get uh, paper resources that help me figure out what the right answers are for you. So I do want to mention one part of that introduction, um, and there's much more going on here in a typical timeline, but I want to highlight that if you're planning to start classes in the United States or just thinking about starting classes in the United States in September of 2022. So in other words, if you're in Duzium right now, or maybe you're in Premier, but you know you're going to take a gap year. Either way, then I'd like you to come away with this with some idea of what you need to do. And that involves having some idea of where you want to apply in the next three months. That's partly because the application process is different for each university. And you're going to want to know if they required things like standardized exams, if they want you to send recommendations from your teachers, or maybe they don't. If they're going to have an essay, you're going to want to have time to write that essay and think about it. So I that want to call your attention on your screen to the fact that you would submit your applications the November before your start. So that means this November. So if you're looking to go to an American university in the fall of 2022 of next year, you are just in time. Now is a great time to be looking at and finding those universities that you are going to apply to later this year. So, but even if you're planning to start your undergraduate education in 2023 or later, Kelly's experiences and advice is going to be really valuable. So without further ado, and thank you very much for your patience and Kelly's, I want to turn it over to her. Kelly, you ready to go? Well, hello, everybody. I am really excited to be able to talk to you guys and to just help explain the college application process because I know it's overwhelming. It's a very difficult kind of decision to make and it can be really confusing. Um, so a little bit about me. I am a double major in architecture and French, and this is my third time studying abroad, but my second time here in Luxembourg. And I go to school at Miami University. So I actually never thought I would end up at Miami. I applied to seven schools in total. They ranged from very prestigious Ivy League schools to local schools close to me where I live in Ohio. And Miami was a backup plan for me. It was my last choice out of what I imagined and where I imagined I would be going because I had a very distinct interest in studying both French and architecture. And so that limited my options quite a bit when it came to looking for schools because depending on the school, they might not let you study outside of your original declared discipline. They want you to stay within your discipline and to focus on that. That is going to be your typical university track and they will encourage you to just study your main degree, which my first degree that I declared was architecture. So one of the schools that I applied to, when I was doing a tour there, they told me, no, you would not be able to get a second degree in French because it is outside of your main area of study, which is called your college. So your university is the large school that houses all of the studies that are available within the university. So Miami University is the name of the school. But then you have the college within the schools. These are branches. So there's a the College of Creative Arts, which with Miami is all of the arts <laughs> that you could consider to be practical, so dance, theater, but it also involves graphic design, architecture, interior design, 
And there are, of course, other colleges, the College of Business, the College of Arts and Sciences, the College of Engineering. But once you are in a college, you then have a department. So the departments are broken down into similar categories. So for example, with the College of Creative Arts, that is my college, I am in the architecture and interior design department. And then my major, my actual declared area of study is architecture. But if we were to look at that, my French degree, it would be Miami University, and then the College of Arts and Sciences, the French, Italian, and Classics department, and then my major is French. So I know that can be kind of a confusing thing to hear, but when I'm switching between these terms, that's kind of the distinction between all of those. So I actually had several of the schools I was applying to tell me, once you choose a college, you can't study outside of that. And that limited my search process down to the seven that I had picked that would let me double major that had a lot of the other requirements I was looking for. So picking a university in the States is very different than picking one here. You have to consider I thought them silly things at first, but they really do matter. Where, where are you comfortable? What kind of climate are you comfortable in? Do you want to have the four seasons? Would you rather be in the sun all the time? So that was a limiting boundary for me. And that kind of narrowed my schools down. I realized I wanted to be on the East Coast or in the Midwest because that was the area I had grown up in, the kind of weather I was familiar with. I'm not the largest fan of 90 degree weather. So I knew the South or heading out West probably wasn't the best fit for me. Excuse me. Um, and then to even narrow it down from there, I looked at schools that had recognized architecture programs, which limited <laughs> the number even further because with specific degree paths that you choose to take or majors you choose to study, there are going to be schools that are better for everything. The Ivy Leagues aren't always the best schools for every major. Uh, they are very prestigious. It does look amazing when you have a degree from them, but they aren't necessarily always the best in what you're trying to do. So after I had figured out that the particular schools that had architecture, I started to look at who would let me double major. And then I narrowed it down again when I realized I wanted to study abroad. So I wanted a very strong study abroad program. And those were just my requirements. Those were something that I was looking for. And I had a very broad search. I only applied to Miami in Ohio, the state I'm from. Everywhere else was about a 10 hour drive in a car for everything else because I realized I was okay with being away from home, which I know would be a large step for you guys being on another, uh, being on another continent entirely. So expanding my comfort level and that comfort zone out to, out to Georgia, out to Virginia, really kind of allowed me to find this perfect fit of schools that I knew I would be happy at. And unfortunately, I didn't get into all of them. I got into three of the seven, which is very normal. And I was a very good high school student. I had a good GPA. I was involved in volunteer work. I worked. And still, I didn't get into the majority of my chosen schools, which is actually very normal. Out of all of my friends, I applied to the least amount of schools with seven. Some of my friends applied to 13. So it really depends on what you're looking for and how comfortable you are with applying to different schools. And for us, we have one application called the Common Application, which can allow us to apply to up to 150 universities with one set of requirements. And then it also lists out 
the individual requirements as needed. So as a uh, arts major, I had to apply to be a part of the architecture department. I had a separate, separate application for that where I had to create a portfolio and that was considered a separate application process for each school from the general application to be accepted into the university. And with Miami, I, as I mentioned, it was not my favorite school. I didn't think I would be going there at all, but getting that acceptance letter and realizing how I felt with on campus, that really made me realize, oh, this is a second home. And that's kind of what college and especially dorm life becomes. You becomes your home away from home. And it's a really nice way to build a support system for yourself kind of outside of everything else that's going on with your classes. Um, and then my, <laughs> So Miami University, as I mentioned, is a liberal arts school. And this means that within your declared major, you have your major studies, which typically are your classes that only really suit your studies. So my stability courses and everything like that, that's within my architecture major. But within a liberal arts college, you are also required to do about 30 credit hours or 10 classes outside of your specialization. And every liberal arts school is a little bit different, but they will all ask you to do English, math, sciences, and more than likely some type of arts requirement to create a more well, well rounded education. And that's what liberal arts schools are for. Whereas a typical university will just push you to stay within that specialization. And those universities are, I'm not gonna say they limit your class options, but typically they have a very well-defined graduation path and they encourage you to stick to that fairly finitely, even if you might have an interest in chemistry when you're studying um, biology, they would still push you to stay within that biology sector unless you were looking to do um, another, another sort of specialization, a major, a minor, something like that. So those are definitely things to consider when you're looking at a university. And many schools advertise whether or not they are liberal arts. So Miami is very proud to say we are a liberal arts school, whereas um, Ohio State isn't. So they are a much more typical, typical track of graduation. Great, thanks, Kelly. Um, could you say a, f a few words about um, you're pursuing a, a double major you, you indicated earlier. And so when you go to plan for what courses you're going to take, how does that work? Like, so you're taking <laughs> like French classes and then you're running off to an architecture class and then you just mentioned uh, liberal arts requirements. So, so you might go to what, a, a public speaking class or, or even a science class or how does that work? Yes, so every university has advisors and these are people who are meant to help you with your scheduling process. I am very lucky to have a very dedicated French advisor who helps me fit all of my requirements 
for my French major, which is about a third of my requirements of my architecture major into my architecture curriculum. So the curriculum for every, every major is very different. Architecture is one of the largest with 94, whereas so about 30, 32 classes that are required of me to take in order to get my architecture degree. Whereas most of your, I would say most majors require the 33 to 40 range of my French major. So about 11 to 13, 14 classes. And the scheduling can be a little bit hectic, but I meet with several advisors, my French advisor, my architecture advisor, and a College of Arts and Sciences advisor to make sure I am hitting all of these requirements. And there have definitely been times where I will have a, a geology class in the morning, and then I go to my French class, and then I go to architecture, and then I go back to French. Or I might have a full day of only architecture curriculum. It's very different for liberal arts majors, I should say, as a whole, because generally we have more required credits. We have these classes called studios, which is where we're doing all of our design work. And those are very long and labor intensive courses. They are typically six credit hours. So double the usual class credits for one of these classes. And that keeps us very busy and on our toes. But for an engineering degree, you might have an engineering course, a public speaking course, a pottery course to fill in your major requirements while also getting those liberal arts requirements in. Oh, okay. So yeah, I kind of have two questions. First of all, if you were just a French major, would that mean you'd be just sitting around for that much time? Um, or what is it? Are you that busy? I understand the scheduling is more difficult because you have more demands, but what would a person who's just a French major do with all that time? So if you're just studying French, a lot of a lot of the different colleges, so the College of Creative Arts doesn't have any additional requirements to graduate with a degree from the college. But the College of Arts and Sciences, where my French major is housed, has additional courses that they require. So these are called the CAS, College of Arts and Sciences requirements. And there are additional language courses, which with a French major, that's not necessary to worry about. But if I were a chemistry major, I would have additional language courses I would be doing. I would have science courses, international studies, public relations courses, history, math, English. So there are more requirements with getting a degree that has less credit hours typically. But then if you have the time, most of your advisors will encourage you to pick up a minor, a double major, a co-major, depending on what your interests are. And I, with the liberal arts requirements, Miami actually requires you to have a, excuse me, a thematic sequence, which is like a miniature minor of sorts in order to graduate. So you have to have you have your general field of study. So if I were just studying architecture, I would also have to get a thematic sequence and something outside of the department. So I could have gotten only a thematic sequence and French. Okay, cool. Thanks. That, that makes it a lot easier to understand. And it sounds like the goal is that you'll be well-rounded no matter what. And it's just that in your case, you're, you're well-rounded around the double major. Whereas if you were just majoring in French, then it would be French plus the well-roundedness and it would take a different mm -hmm. form. So I've just got one more question about that architecture major. You said more than 30 court classes, you know, counting as double classes, the studios and things like that. Does that mean you're taking exactly the same architecture classes as everybody else? Or do you get some choice within your architecture major? It starts to depend. So with first year and second year, you're typically taking the same courses with everyone. Your studio courses, especially, you're in a giant room with the 90 other architecture and interior design majors, which 
really helps foster uh, collaboration between everybody. You can throw design ideas off of one another, which is really nice. But especially as a creative arts major, you get very close with people who are in your degree because at a minimum for the first two years, you're spending most of your time together in classes because we have that fairly strict path to follow. Once you get into third and fourth year, you start to separate out and intermingle with the class either above or below you, taking um, theory courses, design courses, and um, practical courses with people um, that are kind of intermingling a year above and below. Great. It sounds like you do a lot of collaboration with fellow students. Yes. Um, you talk a lot about that. I, I don't know. I, I Let's wait until the end, but I'm, I'm curious to compare your experience with that collaboration compared to the time you spent in Dijon. But let's let's save that for a little bit. Uh, let's first go ahead and uh, define a couple of those terms. So if, if you don't mind, just keep in mind that the, the, the people watching this now and in the future don't necessarily have that big of a background. Could we just run through those first three, double major, co-major, and minor? Because I've got to admit, I'm not even sure what a co-major is, so I'll be learning something yeah. too. Yep. Yeah. So I definitely understand that these are weird terms. They're fairly specific to American universities, I think. And so your typical area of study is your major. So my major is architecture. But then doing a double major means I am stepping entirely outside of my field and picking up another area of study that has no relation to architecture. So French is my double major. And that means you get two degrees, two diplomas, for, so two different pieces of paper um, stating that you had two different studies. A co-major, on the other hand, is staying within your department and receiving one certificate that outlines that you did both studies. So one of my friends was a psychology major and she got a co-major in um, child psychology. So because she was still in the department of psychology, her co-major was child psychology. So a co-major can be something that is different from your original studies, but it's still within your department. And then a minor is half of the class loads of a major. So my French major is 33 credits or 11 courses. A minor is 13 credits or about make sure I'm doing my math right, about five courses uh, in order to complete that minor. And I also managed, I also um, brought up a thematic sequence, which is even less work than a minor. It's typically a string of three or four classes that show you have an interest outside of what you're studying, but it's not as much work as a minor, as a major. It's just showing a diversification of your interests. Okay, thanks, Kelly. I want to take a second and encourage anybody who's attending. You can go ahead and use either the Q&A function or the chat to type out questions if you want to see them answered immediately. A little bit later after we're done with the recording, we'll go ahead and turn this into a, a bigger meeting and put us all on video and chat. But if you've got anything that you want to know now, uh, even if it's a clarification, even if you say like, oh, is there such a thing as a triple major, for example, uh, you're welcome to put that in and, and we'll go ahead and, and recognize that just by typing it in. But again, we'll, we'll get to you voice wise a little bit later. Um, but I have a, a burning question right now, which is, uh, so you have two majors, you're going to get two pieces of paper. Are you going to do that in four years? Is that possible? Yes, it absolutely is. It has taken a lot of work to figure out how to do that. And I have had to do two summer experiences. So I did a study abroad in Dijon, which filled three of my course requirements for French. And then last summer, I was a undergraduate summer scholars recipient. So I did uh, two classes or six credit hours worth of research with the French department. So and it does that take research a lot of was that self-directed or were you part of a study or, or what did was it what did that look like? 
It was a self-directed research project. I was studying architectural references in 16th century French literature. And I was reading from three different French authors and putting together a digital archive of what those architectural references were, what they meant, what they represented within the literature. And now it's a website that I own and I still use and um, kind of have as a example of my work within, within the university. So. That sounds really amazing. So in when we talk about class load, are you talking, that's in part how many classes or how much time you spend in the classroom each mm -hmm. During each semester, right? Is is Miami yes. on a semester basis? So, yeah. what's a typical class like? What's the heaviest and what's the lightest class load that you've had outside of summer? So, I've taken twenty credit hours, which I did when I was here in Luxembourg. Um, most people will never let you go above twenty one. You actually have to petition the university to go above twenty one, and it's very very rare that they let you do that because it just gets to be too much. You don't really have time to eat or sleep, which the university doesn't wanna make you do. Um, for me, with my double major, I typically take about 18 credit hours a semester or um, five classes with my studio counting as a double course. So about six classes. And a, a lighter course load. So if I were only to do the French major and had only the requirements from the College of Arts and Sciences, I could probably get away with doing 15 credit hours. But the minimum to be required a full time student is 12. So the range goes from 12 to 21. It depends on what you're doing with your semester, how many credits you come in with. Um, there are a lot of college college level courses you can take in high school in America or the international baccalaureate, the advanced placement tests, those all come in with credits. And those can fill in some of those liberal arts credits for you or those basic um, general education courses you have to take. So I came in with quite a few of those credits. Even still, I'm at the 18 credit hours just because of all of the requirements within the double major. Great, thanks. Thanks for clarifying that. I'm really excited to hear you talk about external scholarships, about uh, scholarships that are available. I guess, are they available no matter what university you go to or what was your experience in terms of applying for and how, how do those work? Just can you tell us a little bit about, um, I, if you don't mind getting a little personal, about how you financed your education? Because I know a lot of people of are thinking about that. Yes, I was very lucky to receive a large scholarship from Miami and Miami does a tuition guarantee. So the year that I applied and accepted my uh, education at Miami, my tuition was locked in for the next four years. It wasn't allowed to change because of that tuition lock. And my scholarships through Miami actually covered about half of my education. And excuse me, I say half because room and board, which is staying in the dormitories and getting a food plan is very expensive. <laughs> and that was the part which my scholarships didn't cover. So I did look for a lot of outside scholarships. I still look and apply for outside scholarships today because it never hurts. And I started with scholarship engines. So there are a lot out there that exist. The one I'm most familiar with is Unigo. Um, I will put the name in the chat really quickly. And you fill out a general questionnaire. It's a long questionnaire, about 100 questions about yourself. And it finds outside scholarships that fit you, that fit your interests, that fit your hobbies, that fit your personality. And it brings them to your attention for an email. I get about two to three emails a week with new scholarship opportunities from them. And other times I would just search 
sometimes the craziest things like do scholarships exist for people with glasses do scholarships exist for um um for veterans for children of veterans or something like that so trying to find them can be exhausting but there's always something out there i ended up receiving um two scholarships from a veteran society my um great grandfather fought in world war ii my grandfather fought in vietnam and my dad is ex-military as well so i did um essay contests and my essay went through to the second or third round and so i got scholarship money from that i got scholarship money from a couple of organizations in my hometown and those I found through connections my mom had. Some of them I found online. And I have gotten scholarships from Miami as well outside of my original scholarship stipend. The, I know Miami is very good with this. I can't speak to every university, but there are a lot of opportunities to finance anything you want to do. I never thought I would be coming back to Luxembourg for the second time, but I actually am here on scholarship because of a internship scholarship that exists through Miami. So there are a lot of external scholarships out there. They're very competitive. A lot of them are essay based, but it also never hurts to look within the university you're interested in, just constantly checking in reapplying. I've gotten French department scholarships. I've gotten architecture department scholarships just because I'm constantly kind of looking for that. And it does get exhausting, but checking in once every two months isn't too bad just, just to try to keep on top of the opportunities that are out there. Now, now did you start after you became a student at Miami University or, or before that? When did you start looking for those scholarships? I started looking for scholarships um, about the same time I accepted my, um, at the, about the same time I accepted my education from Miami. So about March before I started school in September, 2018. So March, 2018, I started looking for those scholarships and um, started going to school in August of 2018. Oh, okay. So it sounds like it's never too late to start uh, and, and it can help finance your education. That makes sense. Absolutely. Makes, thanks. Um, and I I hope this isn't a sore spot, but you mentioned getting through to the second or third round in an essay contest. Does that mean you don't necessarily have to win the whole thing and you might still get scholarship money? Yeah, absolutely. Oh, okay. As you go through, and it does depend on the competition, but as you go through, generally you can get scholarships even for being put through to the first round so um a unique opportunity i had i applied for the wendy's heisman high school scholarship and i got the i got through to the first round so i think i got it was something small but like 50 dollars towards my education for that and getting through to the second round with the veterans society i believe i got 500 so it greatly depends and varies on the organization, but there are a lot out there that are willing and want to help university students. Oh yeah, so these organizations, they're not like the US government or, or Miami University. They're just ben benefit. It sounds like some of them are like what we would call NGOs here, nonprofits in, in the US. And some of them w were corporations, Wendy's, like the Wendy yes. Corporation has scholarships. Yes, like the fast food chain. Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. So, and I, I know from my own research that some of them are not, you have to be a U.S. citizen, but a lot of them are, or for example, have parents who fought on in, in the U.S. military, um, but plenty of them are available to international students. And there are actually a lot that are also specific to international students that Kelly, yes. you wouldn't even be eligible for. And that's, um, yep. 
those, uh, many of those, not all of them, so I'm glad you mentioned Unigo, but many of those are cataloged under educationusa.state.gov, which is that resource I directed you to in the beginning. Thanks a lot. That was really eye-opening for me too, uh, in terms of what's out there. It sounds like there's a lot. None of it's going to be sort of like, oh, now you're going to college for free, but it can make a difference. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so uh, I'm holding this uh, slide in part because I've got a question about that picture of you and what looked like some friends uh, in doesn't look like a very college campus sort of environment, but I know that it is. Could you tell us what you're doing there? So that's actually at a hockey game. So American universities do fit the trope of having a lot of sports activities and most universities having tickets free to their students. So we have a very large student section in the hockey arena. It's about actually half of the arena is taken up by students. And originally I had no plans to go to this game. I'm not overly interested in hockey. I kind of just randomly thought to go with a bunch of friends. We were all really tired of working on our studio projects and we saw that there was a game. So that night we went and it has become one of my favorite things to go to on campus because they are so fun. They are so energetic. And we have some particular chants that are just hilarious. So it's a really just fun environment to be in and something I never thought I would experience in college, but it is so much fun. And I would recommend to anyone to go to a Miami hockey game because they're hilarious. So you, you, there was no entrance exam for that in particular. You didn't have to take a quiz about hockey in order to-, <laughs> to No, not at all. I showed my student badge. I got a wristband and bought popcorn and sat down. So <laughs> That's great. That's a great example. Thanks for telling us about that. And thanks for sharing that photo. And thanks to everybody else in the photo too. Um, I, I think that we're, uh, we should move on to some questions. If people want to put those in the chat or the Q and a, we'll do a, a couple before we stop recording, but I am going to stop sharing this slide just so that we can see faces. So hello, Kelly now in larger form. Um, I, I did want to ask to sort of get us started. Um, I, I do want to open the floor as soon as possible to, you know, the people who have the questions, but, uh, you spent time in, in Dijon at, at the, what would we call it in English, the University of Dijon there? And uh, I've never uh, been. University of Bourgogne. Oh, okay, thanks. Um, so can you tell us a little bit, especially like, I mean, most of the people who are gonna see this are, are or are watching it now are probably more familiar with the University of Bourgogne than they are with Miami University. What were some differences that you noticed just as a newcomer to that environment? The largest difference was the dorm life. So living in a French dorm was like living in a little capsule. You had your bed, your bathroom, you had everything you needed in one room and then a shared kitchen. They only like had to use because you had a fridge in your dorm as well. And that's not the experience that I had at Miami at all. I had two different roommates for one freshman year, one sophomore year. Uh, because as a university student at almost any college university, you're required to spend the first two years in the dorms. So I was very lucky to have two great people as uh, roommates, but it would have been next to impossible to get a single room. It's not very common in the States. They do exist, but they're normally reserved for those with additional with disabilities, special requirements. Um, so it really is part of the experience of a, of a American university to stay in a dorm room with sometimes a random stranger, other times someone from home. So my first uh, roommate was a friend of mine from high school, but I didn't know her very well. We ended up becoming best friends. My next roommate was someone I didn't know at all. And we became close, but not 
at like best friend level. I still talk to her, but it's not like an everyday occurrence. Whereas when you're living with someone, you kind of pick up on their habits and it's really a nice way to almost have a guaranteed buddy, especially for the first couple of weeks you're in school, because it's, it can be overwhelming having 20,000 people on campus and knowing at least one definitely helps. So um, the two bedrooms are probably the most common and the most typical, but there are also three and four bedrooms. So you could have more roommates, less roommates, kind of depending on your comfort level with uh, people you already know that are going there or with um, random assignments, which work out really well as well. So you said two bedroom, that does mean you do have some private space. It's not that you're in bunk beds and you never get out of each other's presence or? Um, they aren't bunk beds, but they're in the same room together. You share a communal bathroom with typically the rest of your like little wing of the building. And um, yeah, no, you're never, I can't say you're never alone, but it's a very rare moment when you are. You have to seek it out, definitely. Gotcha. That's really interesting. <laughs> Thanks. Any other uh, things that you noticed while you spent time in Dijon that you would want uh, people to know here in Luxembourg? The public transportation on Dijon's campus was integrated as part of um, the city's public transportation. So there wasn't anything different, all the buses, trams, those were all a part of uh, just city public transportation. That's not how Miami works. Miami's buses run separately from Oxford's, even though we are literally right on top of one another, there are still separate buses, bus systems. Um, the public transportation here is a lot more efficient and timely. I've never ridden a bus at Miami because they're never on time. So it's a lot faster to just walk everywhere. And something that can be a little bit disconcerting, especially about Miami's campus, all the buildings look the same. Um, they're all red brick and it can be kind of difficult to understand what building you're looking for when you don't know that it looks the same as its neighbor. <laughs> So, they so that's the confusing. downside to the American college look. It really is like they show in the movies, but there's a dark side to it. You wander into the wrong building sometimes. Yeah, definitely have. And it's kind of a running joke on Miami's campus. If you go up to ask someone where a building is, their first response is, oh, the red brick one over there. Um, and then they actually tell you how to get to the building you're looking for. But it's just, it can be a little bit monotonous, but there's also a beauty in kind of the uniformity. Sure, sure. The pictures of, of the campus are just amazing looking, but I can totally see what you mean because you sent me a few pictures and one was of a residence hall and another one was of an administration building and I could not, for the life of you, me tell you which one was which unless I looked at the titles. Yeah, they look identical. So that can make it a little bit hard that first week of classes but you definitely get familiar with your settings, especially with a campus like Miami. So Miami is, um, we are separate from the city of Oxford, but we butt up right against it on several places. But the university itself is kind of in its own bubble mm. and each area kind of fits into the general red brick but also has its own unique pieces. So the dorms are typically have a lot more windows than all of your classroom buildings. And there's a lot more student activity within the kind of parks between each of the buildings. So the quads, that's what they're called. Um, each quad definitely has a lot of student life between it. So you never really have to worry about like not knowing where you're going because you can always walk up to someone and say, um, am I on the right part of campus? Am I where I'm supposed to be? Which is really nice because you're never more than a 10 minute walk away from almost any building on campus. 
but there are definitely some of those larger campuses in cities, like uh, I will refer to Ohio State again, you could be on a bus for 20 minutes and still not be close enough to the building you need to be between classes. So that also is something to consider when you're looking for your university. Do you want something that's spread out? Do you know you want all of your classes to be kind of within one little section of campus? And that's also, I guess, a scheduling thing you can decide on as well. Yeah, I went to a campus that's about the same size as Ohio State, and I'll tell you that we had, they moved actually from 10 to 15 minute passing periods, and I still couldn't make it from my engineering classes to my philosophy classes. Uh, and I wound up, when you talked about having to do the scheduling and getting advice from an advisor, I actually wound up choosing my classes in part, you know, whether I could make it in between them. And uh, so there were one or two classes I wanted to take that I couldn't make it physically between the two. So that is an advantage of a uh, more compact, I won't say smaller, because Miami University's campus is not small. It's not like it's just a few. No. But the academic buildings are kept together largely, so that makes it really nice. I could walk from the furthest edges, which is the library, over to the art building, and it would maybe take me 10 minutes. And in between, almost everybody you saw would be un uh, university students or staff or faculty. It's just sort of yep. self-contained in that way? Very much so. Um, even a good portion of the city that's closest to the university is uh, student housing, not necessarily owned by the university, but there's uh, your Greek life, your Greek organizations, um, and a lot of just housing for your third, fourth year students. Thanks. Greek life is a whole other thing. I think we're going to have to have a whole separate webinar about that. And that I can't different. get into. I am not. <laughs> I wasn't either. So we'll find an expert for that one in a, in a future yeah. semester. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and uh, show a final slide so we can uh, provide some useful information before we wrap this up. Is it displaying correctly? Or is it displaying my notes? Okay, great. So uh, I just want to make sure everybody knows that you, if you have, if you want to follow up on this, if this just raised more questions or or got you interested, please do contact your advisor or the public affairs section of the U.S. Embassy. For example, we talked about colleges within universities, but you might go to a website and find some university had decided, oh, we're not going to call them colleges, we're going to call them divisions, or we're going to call them schools. And if it, you don't have to figure that out. So you've got people like me with the help of people like Kelly, to who can say like, oh, divisions are just colleges, they're the same, or maybe say actually that university is organized differently, because in the United States, each university gets to make up its own way of organizing, and some of them can be quite innovative. Uh, Miami University is innovative in its own way, um, but uh, they do stick with the college way of organizing things. But you'll find other ones that say like, oh, no, we're actually one big college. Or they'll say, no, we go straight down to programs, um, or maybe they call them classes. I don't know. You, you can come up with almost any variation and you'll find it somewhere at a uh, U.S. university. So uh, I also want to invite everyone to a webinar that's coming up next Tuesday, uh, June 29th. It starts at 7.30 p.m. And at that one, you'll get a view of that variety of uh, educational institutions because we're going to have five different universities that are all in Washington state. So remember Kelly talked about, you know, feeling like a climate is familiar. Maybe you don't want to challenge in that area. Maybe you do. Well, Washington State is a lot like uh, Luxembourg, in fact, um, although the mountains are higher um, and uh, you'll get to hear all about how uh, beautiful it is in Washington State. But of all the places you could live, that's probably the closest in terms of just what it feels like climate wise to be there. But that's not the only reason to go to Washington State. And so we'll hear from five different institutions, including public colleges, big ones, small ones, a uh, community college, they can talk about that way of approaching things. That's on June 29th. Uh, and also uh, our webinars, the record, previous recorded ones are available on YouTube under Education USA Luxembourg. And just one more time, I wanna invite you to have one-on-one -on -one conversations and advising with uh, me or another Education USA advisor here in Luxembourg. Yeah, thank you all for watching. And uh, again, please don't hesitate to contact us. Thank you very much, Kelly. Really appreciate your time. That was uh, amazing descriptions that really help people understand what's going on. Of course, I hope that 
everyone found it helpful and the vocabulary didn't get too confusing because I know it can be overwhelming. Uh, you were super clear about it, but if they do have any questions, they know who to reach out to.